man. Please sit. sit. Well, um, it's definitely not summer anymore. I think we can agree on that. And as the season shifts, so do our clothes. Uh, you all look like you are definitely into fall season. Both in the colors and the outfit. And right there with you. Got on my, my big woolly coat too. Now, the same way we dress for today, I'd like to ask you, are you dressed for heaven? Hmm. John Newton was the author of the hymn, Amazing Grace. He said, when I get to heaven, I shall see three wonders there. The first wonder will be to see many there whom I did not expect to see. The second wonder will be to miss many people whom I did expect to see. The third and greatest of all will be to find myself there. Amen. Bow your heads with me. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is made. Make it a word of power and peace. Convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life, so that as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, Jesus gives us what I shall call an interesting but troubling image of heaven in today's gospel text. <laughs> Beginning at verse one, and again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Now, if you have read Matthew more than once, you are familiar with certain parables, like, for example, the sheep and the goats, the parable of the woman with the 10 coins. Well, something that those parables have in common that is not found in this parable is Jesus prefaces those parables in Matthew 25 with the words, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to. He says this after describing in Matthew 24 all the things that shall happen before his return. This parable, however, is not preceded by that information. This parable is preceded by the other parables he told in Matthew 21. The parables when he was telling the scribes and the Pharisees, basically, that they can either except that he is who he says he is and respond properly to that or continue to walk in unbelief. And this parable addresses that issue, amen? Now, the only thing more amazing to me than amazing grace is the amazing rejection of that grace by so many. Now, this is in spite of the oft-claimed desires of so many for worlds that looks a lot like heaven, in that there will be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more injustice, no more death. Everybody says they want a world like that. People are willing to go to great lengths to pursue things that they think will get them a world like that, but they want to add the caveat they want a world like that, a world like the kingdom of heaven, but they don't want heaven. Now, when God's holy and righteous law is declared, both to exhort us to live justly, righteously, and godly in this world, and to show us our sin so that we can cling to God's eternal promise of salvation, so many push back, declare that, they're not subject to that law, that God doesn't have that claim on their lives because 
they don't give him the authority to be in their lives. But somehow that reminds me of the gazelle who says to his other gazelle mates, as they're telling him, we need to move. He says, well, I don't believe in life. I'm not going to live my life in fear of something I've never seen, that I have no evidence that it exists. I am not going to give power to this story about the lion. Meanwhile, there's a rustling and a growling in the bush. Let me continue our text. Again, he sent to other servants saying, tell those who are invited, look, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Now, I wish Jesus were just talking about the world in general, or Jews in the first century Judea. But I don't think so. Because he's talking about people in the world, and because I've lived long enough to see it, I can tell you it goes on in church too. People who are united to Christ by holy baptism into his death when they were younger, or maybe even not so young, disparage his word in the pure preaching of the gospel when they think themselves to be smarter, older, preferring to have their ears tickled by entertaining heretics who fill bookshelves and airwaves with false gospels and alternative Christ. One such person just passed away this week. There was a book a few years ago called Jesus Calling. The theme of the book was apparently the notion that God, the Lord Jesus specifically, is still having conversations. And that whilst the author would say, well, I'm not saying that this is inspired like the scriptures, but how do you say God spoke to me and I wrote it down and the rest of us aren't supposed to think that this is the fifth gospel? And so people bought that book. They bought that book because basically people who love God want to hear from God. Don't you want to hear from God? Don't you want to know what God thinks about you? Don't you know what God wants you to do? And so he gave you a Bible said this is God breathed and it's profitable for doctrine and reproof and instruction in righteousness and some folk apparently enough folk so that he had a nice little you know income and had some fame enough people so that Walmart put the book on the shelf and Bible bookstores put the book on the shelf and by the way in case you didn't know this Bible bookstores don't exist to edify you I know that's a revelation and a shock, but they aren't existing just to make sure you get edified. If they don't turn a profit, guess what? They'll find something else to do. They're not selling you coffee cups because coffee cups will build up your faith. They sell you coffee cups with Jesus' name on it because, well, if you see Jesus' name on something, it's got to be good. And so, and in the pages of this book, Jesus was supposedly talking and telling us things. And so what if this book, the very existence of this book, didn't fly in the face of what God said in his word, all holy scriptures are, are God-breathed? Well, if anything that God speaks is therefore holy, and anything written down of God speaking is holy, then any book that claims to be God's word to you is claiming to be another gospel. Amen, Wall. And she's not the only person that did that. There have been books like that. You know, we know about the Quran. God supposedly dictated that to uh, Muhammad. 
And then there's the Book of Mormon and, you know, the angel. Uh, I can't even remember the angel's name. That's how unimportant he is to me. But some angel told this guy in New York, hey, these are, this is another testament to Jesus Christ. And a whole bunch of people are walking around trying to figure out, should they obey the Bible or should they obey the Book of Mormon? Well, which one is God's book? So I know that God spoke in the Bible. I don't know about these other books. I know that God inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't know about these other gospels. And I don't need to know about them because I've got the one that I know. I've got the one that, that the church has passed on generation after generation after generation and confirmed this is the word of God. Herein are contained the exceeding great and precious promises of God. The message of Jesus Christ. Here is good news that you can trust in. I can't trust in Hal Lindsey. <laughs> He cool, we good like that, but I can't say that everything he said or wrote down came straight from the throne of grace. I just can't, because it's not the Bible, amen? In our parable, God, or the king, who represents God, sent his servants out because the people who were originally invited, the ones that had the written invitation, the ones that knew that when it was a wedding day, they were supposed to be there to celebrate, decided that they had better things to do, that his son's wedding was not important for them. And so he sent his servants out to get other folk. Now, picture, if you will, these servants going out, they were given specific instructions, go out to the main roads, whoever you see, you grab. They grabbed good folk. They grabbed folk that was walking with their kids to go play. They grab folk who are on their way to sell their wares. They grab folk who are on their way to do some work for somebody. They grab bad folk. They grab the pimp, the drug dealer, the pimp's workers, the dice rollers. They grab it. They didn't ask them a thing other than, are you breathing? The king said, come. Now, some of those folks, you know, the good folk, they were excited. The king has invited us to his home. This is What's going to happen? Why are we being blessed with this? And those other folk, they might not have been so happy. I don't know if the police roll up on a bunch of young men as they're standing on the corner holding some plastic bags. They said, hey, the mayor wants to see you right now. I don't know if they'd feel all too happy about that. But nevertheless, they got scooped up into the car and they drove on off. So they get to the banquet. These people, they come in with the service and they see this banquet. Probably some of those good folk got to thinking, well, maybe the king needs more servants. Okay, fine. And then the bad people are like, I didn't want to be here in the first place, but I can't get away. While they're thinking about this, all of a sudden the servants start handing out clothes. Very nice looking clothes too. Special clothes. Clothes like they've never seen before. And so they take the clothes, they, the servants say, put them on, and come on in and sit down. So everybody does what the servants say, except there's one person. Y'all know there's always one person, isn't there? There's always one person who says, I can have my cake and eat it too. I can do, I can be where God says be, and I can do what I want to do. And it'll all work out because, well, I came, didn't I? I'm doing God a favor just by showing up. There's that one person. And there's that one or maybe a few of people who they embrace God's gift of grace. They, they're baptized. They receive, they're confirmed. They receive communion. They start the job right. And then they get to thinking that, well, Jesus opened the door for me, but I, I need to show him that I deserve to be here. So I need to work, 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 work. 99 and a half won't do, Lord. I'm trying to make 100 because I want you to see how much I deserve to be here. And God has said, look, I'm 
putting you here. I'm setting you here in heavenly places. I'm giving you the clothes you need to be here. The robes of righteousness. They say, oh, but my clothes look good, Lord. Matter of fact, these clothes I got, they fit me nice. They make me look good. I think I should wear my clothes. And so they walk around in God's wedding feast just as proud as a peacock because they've got some nice looking clothes. Right? They think those their clothes look way better than the robes that the king gave these other folks. Those robes look rather plain. They don't look special. They look ordinary. They're, they're nice, they're clean, but they're ordinary. Where is their clothes? Oh, look at these clothes. <laughs> Dr. Luther said something about people like that. He said, he who would gain righteousness by faith and works is like the dog who runs beside a stream with a piece of meat in his mouth. And he looks over and he sees in the stream another dog with a piece of meat in his mouth. And he thinks to himself, I'm bigger than that dog. I'm going to take his meat. And as soon as he opens his mouth, to snap at it, he loses both the meat and the reflection. The color, he knew the design, and he sees that one. It's a nice looking suit, too. Not as good as the king's robes, but it looked nice. But it wasn't the king's outfit. And so he walks up to the man. Excuse me, sir. And the guy's like, hey, 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 how you? Oh, your majesty. Uh, how'd you get in here without... A wedding garment. Now, I give the man credit for this. There's some folk that would have sat right then at that moment and tried to justify themselves, just like there are people who will stand flat-footed and tell you that they don't have any sins they need to repent of. They haven't done anything wrong. They're good people. Surely God will judge them. I mean, after all, look at the really bad people. Well, the really bad people had no sins to put on that road. And so the king looked at this man and said to his servants, tie him up hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. I know this is an amazing thing, that there are people who go, the world would describe them as good people, as wonderful people, as role models and iconic figures, and in hell they will lift up their eyes. And it won't be because the world was lying about them. They were good people, but they weren't God's people. God's people are marked because not only are they in God, but God is in them. God's people are marked because they are in Christ through holy baptism, and Christ is in them as they hear the word and they eat of that sacrament, that holy bread and that holy wine, the body and blood of Christ. God comes into you. As you come into God, God knows his own. He knows his sheep. His sheep know him. They don't follow another voice. They don't set up their own standards. They don't set up their own pathway into the kingdom. They walk on his highway rather than pave their own. But there are those folks who think that their concrete is better than God's concrete. Their stones are better than his stones. Their rules are better than his rules. And they can tell you that they can create heaven on earth without God. They can be good without God. And they're lying to themselves. They're lying to God. And he's not believing it. And they're lying to you. And if you're not careful, some of you might believe. After all, they look like you. They're garments are white clean just like yours are but god didn't clean them they put some white paint on their robe to cover up the stains they put some untempered mortar on their building to make it look like it was strong but it wasn't and god has but one thing to say to those people depart from me you curse and whether God says it to those people when Christ returns at the last day or he says it to them on their death day, it's the same result. Just like for the saints, if the Lord comes for me tonight or if he tarries with me until he comes for everybody, it's going to be the same. Because 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And your hope is the same as mine because God didn't play special with me. I needed his help just like you did. I needed his grace just like you do. And the mercies of the Lord are new every morning for me just as much as they are for you. Every morning I have to get up and thank him that he kept me last night from all harm and danger. And I have to ask him, Lord, keep me from sin today. And then tonight I'm going to say to him just like y'all, Lord, forgive me the sins that I've committed this day. Because I'm like you. I'm just somebody on the highway that the servants grabbed up and said, come to the feast, praise God. And now the wedding feast is ready, saints. It's ready. You don't have to wait for the last day. The Bible says we are seated with him in heavenly places today. The Bible says we have an inheritance in him now. The, God, the Bible, God's word says we are blessed now. Not we shall be later, we are now. And so Paul could say, regardless of my outward circumstances, whether I've been rich or poor, abounding, I am content. Why is Paul content? Paul's content is because whatever else he's got, he's got Jesus. Do you have Jesus, saints? Well, if you got Jesus, you got all you need, amen? Now, he's not the only person you need, but he's the all you need. The other people that got Jesus, amen? He's all you need to get along with the people that don't got Jesus. He's all you need to tell the devil I don't need you. He's all you need. Because he is all that God has. Amen. And so for those of you that have him, and I'm trusting that's pretty much everybody I'm looking at, but if not, we know how to get him to you. Just stick around and ask and we'll tell you. Because we don't mind sharing Jesus with anybody that needs Jesus, amen? And the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let all God's people say amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Now we continue our worship. <laughs> 